read the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we look at these glorious truths that you have revealed to us in your word, I pray that you would give me your spirit, Lord, to preach. Give your spirit to the hearers here, Lord. That the lost, that those who are dead in their sins would be convicted and they would be converted. That they would become jealous of the incredible glories of heaven that you have promised to your children. And that they would flee the wrath to come and run into your arms the arms of a merciful Savior who's willing to forgive. Give us your spirit now, I pray. Show us what we do not see. Teach us what we do not know. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, last week in our journey through this letter of Peter to the church, we looked at Peter's task or call. We looked at Peter's call for us as Christians to build upon our faith. We've been several weeks now in 2 Peter and we've been examining these glorious realities of this faith, the imperishable faith of which we hold that has all of the precious and very great promises given to us. And Peter has told us to build. He's saying work, Christian. Work to gain a true knowledge, to build upon your knowledge of Christ in, in greater knowledge, build upon your faith with virtue. He wants us, as we saw, to build for a purpose. He wants us to build for the purpose of proving that we are, in fact, chosen and called. We talked about this briefly, but Peter is not asking us to earn our salvation. He's not asking us to build and to work so that we would be saved, so that we would be justified, so that we would gain God's approval. He's asking us to work in order that we might show sufficient evidence that we are, in fact, called. He is saying, in essence, you know that salvation that I opened this letter with, guys? You know that incredible salvation? I want you to confirm that you do, in fact, possess it. This isn't foreign language to Scripture. Paul spoke this way to the Thessalonians. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
We see in 1 Thessalonians, Paul, like Peter, in his introduction to the Thessalonians, speaks very much like Peter speaks. He says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look what he says. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They had proven their election. We know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. They had so proven by building upon their faith that here the Apostle Paul, looking from the outside in, could actually say, I know you're elect. I know you're chosen and called. Why? The evidence is there. There's sufficient evidence of your working. Look at verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. They were becoming more and more like Christ. They had their eyes fixed upon the Lord and were being transformed into that same degree of glory. And that is it. That's what Peter's calling us to do here. He wants us to be Christians that are growing in the experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. Expanding our understanding of this glorious gospel and adding to it conformity to Christ's image. But then we asked last week, okay, Peter, you want us to show sufficient evidence that we are saved, but why? Why do you want us to do this? For what purposes? And if you remember, we saw four. We saw first, so as not to render yourself useless and unfruitful. You can go ahead and turn back to 2 Peter. He tells us, I want you to build so you're not useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he also, as we saw, wants us to build and show our faith true so that we are not among those who are deceived. So that we are not among those hypocrites that enter the day of judgment thinking we will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom only to to hear from him, depart from me, I never knew you. And further, we saw that why we are to build, to provide ourselves a confidence in our salvation from which we can work, from which we can serve the church, from which we can look outward, not always worried about our standing. Are we saved? Are we in? Are we not? He wants us to build so that there is evidence that we are his so that we can be active in the service of the Lord. And fourthly, we saw that this building, this evidence of our faith, is for those out there, for the lost world to look at you and see something different, to see your good works, to see the hope that you have that they don't, to be jealous of that, to give glory to your Father in heaven. But this morning, I want to turn our attention to one more reason why we are called to make our calling and election sure. One more grand motivation from Peter why we are to build, and it's found in verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The New American Standard says, For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. This is it. This is the motivation. There will be for you an abundant entrance. You will be richly supplied an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Scripture has much to say about kingdom. And I want us to briefly look at a few of the things that are said in Scripture about this concept of the kingdom. First, it's secret or mysterious. Jesus, speaking to his disciples in Matthew 13, says, 
after they say, Jesus, why do you speak in parables about the kingdom? He's saying the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. They say, why in parables? And Jesus answered them in Matthew 13. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. This kingdom, there's a mystery to it. There's a secret to it. And Jesus says, to you it's been revealed. To others it's not. So the kingdom is secret or mysterious. But further, we see that the kingdom is present. It is a present reality. What did John the Baptist come proclaiming? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near, and Jesus Christ himself. Repent, believe the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is a present reality. Thirdly, it's spiritual. Do you remember what Jesus said to Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. It is a spiritual kingdom. We say, what, what, how is it a spiritual kingdom? And we find it's a spiritual kingdom in that it is the reign, it is the kingly reign of God in the hearts of men. Think about the entrance requirements to enter this kingdom. If this were an earthly kingdom, it would make sense that there would be certain requirements. Who gets to go in and out? And Christ says, this is a, this is a spiritual kingdom, and there are certain entry requirements. What's the first in John 3? Unless one is born again, unless one is made new, unless one is regenerated, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. No less enter it. You must be born again. There must be a regenerative work of the Spirit in your life to even enter it. But further, we see that repentance is an entrance requirement. How is Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler? What did he tell him to do? Go, sell all that you have. Come follow me. See, the rich young ruler was trusting in his riches, the idolatry of earthly wealth. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to turn from what you're trusting in this earth. You've got to repent from your idolatry. Put it down and follow me. The rich young ruler refused. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God to enter the spiritual kingdom of God. We also see that childlike faith or belief is an entry requirement into this kingdom. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God unless you are humbled and put your faith and trust in Christ alone, you cannot enter this kingdom. So we see that this kingdom is a present spiritual kingdom reality. It is the reign of Christ Jesus in our hearts through the gospel. You see, the Jews were so busy looking for a physical kingdom to come. They were looking for Christ to come in pomp and power and overrun the Romans. And they were looking and saying, surely he can't be the Messiah coming in on a foal. He's, where's the glory here? Where's he going to come and conquer? And Jesus is over and over correcting them. This is not my, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is the reign of God in the hearts of men. And we see that here in our text. Look here in 2 Peter 1. Look at verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Or in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Or again in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is present and it is the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is the kingdom knowing Jesus experientially, knowing him as Lord, 
as ruler, as master over your life. Not just an intellectual ascent or understanding, but the real, vivid, alive, experiential knowing of Christ. Knowing him as my master, my Lord, my savior, my Christ, my dis- Messiah, my deliverer. That is the kingdom of God. The true experiential knowledge of Christ in your heart. Scripture has much to say about the kingdom, how to enter it, how to miss it, how to thrive within it. But there is another dimension to the kingdom. It is also a future kingdom. And that's what Peter is dealing with in our text. Look at verse 11. For in this way there will be, in the future, there will be provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The eternal kingdom is heaven. The immediate hope of the Christian's glorious entrance into the presence of God upon their death. We see Paul speaking similarly. We won't look there now, but in 2 Timothy, Paul also talks of a heavenly kingdom. This is the future kingdom yet to come the future dwelling place of all believers in consummate glory with God. And so what I want us to to do today is to take some time to look at several truths that are important for us to understand about this eternal kingdom of heaven. We'll see ten different truths. The first, heaven is a continuation The end state of heaven does not appear merely after this life ends, but it comes on account of this earthly life. Now this is first and foremost ought to be primary in our understanding. Heaven is a continuation. It is determined by what happens here on earth in time. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God is not mocked. Heaven is a continuation of this life. What did Jesus Christ tell his father in the high priestly prayer? This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Heaven, for the believer, begins now. Heaven is not something that just simply starts at your death. Heaven is a continuation of what was begun on earth. It is the fulfillment of the fellowship, the union, the love that the believer experiences now on earth. Yes, there will be changes. There will be many glorious changes of which we will speak in heaven. But first and foremost, heaven is a continuation from what has already begun here. And this leads us to the reality that heaven is redemptive. Heaven is not the inevitable end for all people. In our natural condition, we are headed, we are plunging towards hell. In our natural condition as men, we are barreling headlong towards eternal destruction. That is our plight and end. We've taken God's laws. We've chosen instead to put our desires in their place. Paul tells the Ephesians, let no one deceive you with empty words, for on account of these things, the things that you and I in our natural condition love to do, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. But what happened, believer? What happened for you and I? Christ 
interceded. Like Paul on the Damascus Road, Jesus Christ came down and stopped us in our tracks and he interceded on our behalf. He put his blood in our place. He took the wrath that we deserve. Here we are barreling towards hell, recklessly plunging towards eternal death and Christ plucks us from darkness and we are redeemed. Price for our sins paid by another. And where does our course change? We go from headlong into hell to being turned around and headed for heaven. Heaven is for those. It's the destiny. It's the ending point for those that are redeemed. It is not the inevitable end for all. So we see it's a continuation for the believer. It's for the redeemed, not for all. But thirdly, heaven is Christ centered. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14 that he would go and prepare a place for them. Why? That they may come and dwell where he dwells. He is the centerpiece of this eternal dwelling. Turn, if you will, to Revelation 21. We'll see this glorious reality. Revelation 21 Verses 22 and 23. Here, John and his vision of glory tells us that, beginning in verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. And its lamp is the Lamb, the lamp of the light of heaven. The radiance of its brightness and glory is what? The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He is the focal point. He's the centerpiece. He is the radiance of the glory of heaven. Now think about this. Pause and ponder this. If Jesus Christ is the centerpiece and the very focal point of eternal life in heaven, and our heaven begins here on earth as a continuation, isn't the reverse also true for hell? Some have said, in an effort to deny eternal hell, well, my hell is here and now. And no, that is not true entirely, but it is true in part. There is absolutely a reality where your hell is here and now, but there is a future hell to come. Scripture is clear on that. For the wicked, hell is not here alone, but it is a foretaste. And you say, where are you going? Think about this. If Christ is the centerpiece of heaven, if he is its focal point, if he is its glory and radiance, and if heaven is a continuation of this life, of this unity and fellowship and love we have for Christ, hell is simply a continuation for the lost person of this life where there is no love for Christ. There is no fellowship with Christ. If Christ is not the central focus of your life now, if he is not the centerpiece for you now, he will not be for eternity. In essence, if you say, I want my life now, I want my pleasure now, but I want heaven then, listen to me, heaven the central focal point of heaven is Christ. And if you don't want Christ now, you will not want him in any way then. The believer cannot wait to be in perfect communion with their Lord. And yet you who sit here this morning knowing nothing of this love for Christ, you can't, you're not anxiously awaiting to enter eternal, the eternal kingdom of heaven to see more of Christ. You don't even want him now. You certainly will not want him then. Both spiritual life and spiritual death 
are foretasted in this life. What you desire now, you will desire for eternity. What you do not desire now, you will not desire for eternity. Christ is the central focal point of heaven. Further, heaven is immediate. Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he would rather be away from his body and at home with the Lord. In Philippians 1, he actually says, I'm hard pressed between the two, whether I stay here in my body or I go home with the Lord. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Upon exiting this world at your death, Believer, you are immediately ushered in to the presence of the Lord. And I would ask you, I would ask myself, are we living lives that are so fixated upon the life to come, that so fixated upon this glory to be, that we feel like the Apostle Paul, I would rather be away from this body and at home with the Lord. That was a reality for the Apostle Paul. It was certainly a reality for the Apostle John, was it not? The end of Revelation, come Lord Jesus, come quickly Lord Jesus. The Christian whose mind is stayed upon eternity will have an urgency in this life, will they not? They will have an urgency with eternity fixed on their mind, longing to be there as they look at this dying world, as they see men, not as mere temporal creatures, but as eternal souls. There will be an, an urgency in their desire to bring men into the kingdom, to plead with them to turn from their sin. The Christian whose mind is stayed and fixated upon heaven will be radically useful in this life. To quote Sam Storms, he says, We will never be of much use in this life until we've developed a healthy obsession with the next. So many Christians look, or so-called Christians you could say, look at this radical nature and say, Hey, relax. You're so focused on eternity. You're so focused on this gospel. You're so radical and you're relaxed. You're not going to fit in. Be cool. Just simmer it down a little bit. You're too intense. But the gospel that Christ calls us to is not a gospel where we're trying to fit in with this life, build up earthly possessions. The gospel he calls us to over and over is a gospel where our minds are fixated upon the eternal realities to come. That like Spurgeon, we can say we plead with men with their arms around their knees. If they are to perish, let them perish running over our dead bodies. There's an urgency of eternity. Jonathan Edwards beautifully said, labor to get a sense of the vanity of this world and labor to be much acquainted with heaven. Believer, heaven is immediate. At your exit from this world, you enter the presence of the Lord at home with your Savior. What kind of life will that cause you to live? A life that causes you to be willing to give up these earthly possessions for the sake of the gospel, not amassing all of this and scared to touch it and, oh, if I go there, that will be, my body may be at risk, my possessions at risk. Someone whose mind is on eternity says, away with it all. I'm serving the Lord. And if I die, I go to heaven. What does it profit you if you gain the whole world? My soul is safe. For me to live is Christ. What is to die? Gain. Kill me. I immediately enter into eternal glory. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Heaven, this kingdom to which we will enter, is perfection. 
Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Upon your entrance into this eternal kingdom, your spirit will be perfected. No sin in you, no sin around you. Like the words of Horatio Spafford's glorious hymn, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Except not only will we not bear this sin, we will have no remnants of it left for us to fight, for us to wrestle against. Think of it, believer, the only thing that gets in the way of your perfect communion and fellowship with your God and Savior is your sin. That's it. Satan doesn't get in your way. He oppresses and tempts, but you only give in to sin when, you're in, when you follow your desires. The only thing that gets in the way between you and your Savior is your sin. And for the believer who cries out, Lord, rid me of this sin. Lord, I want to know you more. Give me your, more of your presence. What a glorious reality. In heaven, your soul will be perfected. Nothing to come in between. Nothing as a barrier between you and your Lord. Perfect, holy communion with your Savior who laid his life down for you. The Savior who looked at you in your wretched condition and said, I want him in my family. I want to die for him. I want to save him. That great love with which he loved you. No more will imperfection keep you from perfect union with your Savior. The one who's done so much to redeem you. Your soul will be made perfect. And in the new heavens and the new earth, in full redemption when Christ comes again and restores all of creation, so will your body. Perfect. Further, heaven is fixed. It is a fixed reality. What do I mean? There is no transition from it. In the last day, in the judgment, <clears throat> upon your death, the author of Hebrews tells us it is appointed for man to die once, and at death comes judgment. Upon the judgment of your soul, you enter into heaven. Final. There's finality. There's no worry about transitioning out into hell. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that when he comes again, he will separate the goats and the sheep. The sheep into eternal life. Eternal life. Life forever. No transition out of it. And the goats, the wicked, into eternal death. There is no possibility for you to fall from heaven. And as glorious as this is, it ought to be equally frightening to those of you who sit here who do not know the Lord, as the believer basks in the reality that there is no chance for me to fall from heaven, I'm set, I'm fixed in eternal bliss. So you who die in your sin are fixed for eternal torment. Adam, our first father, in the perfect state of the garden, had the capability to fall. The believer in heaven will have no such capability, but neither will those in hell be capable of repenting. 
Christ says today, while you hear his voice, repent. Jesus Christ is pleading with you who do not know him while you're alive. Repent. Why? Because the eternal state is fixed. Once you have entered into eternity outside of the kingdom of God, there is no turning back. There is no end to the agony. There is only increase of agony for eternity. For the believer, it's a glorious reality. No more wrestling against sin. No more fear of falling. But for the unbeliever, it is the most horrific reality. But further, for the believer, heaven is a place of rest. Do turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verses 9 through 12. Hebrews 4, verse 9. The author writes, So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What is he talking about, strive to enter that rest? He's talking about, he's exhorting us not to be like the Israelites. You know, the Israelites who were wandering in the wilderness they, they, they failed to enter the land of Canaan, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because of their disobedience. And the author of the Hebrews is saying, strive to enter that rest, not a physical Canaan, but the eternal rest for your souls. And Jesus says, this land of Canaan, this land of Canaan to which the Israelites were seeking to go, it's a foretaste. It's a foretaste of what? Eternal rest. Christ cut, says, Come to me, all you who weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest for your souls. Certainly in this life, but how much more in the life to come? You know, in this life, it's a battle. This life is a warfare. Certainly we can resist Satan. And what is the promise? He will flee. We find rest there. We can remove ourselves from the temptations of the world. We can come into the house, of, the house of worship and praise with the saints and we find rest from the temptations of the world. But we can never rest from the remaining flesh, the sin that remains in us that is constantly seeking to entrap us. We can't for a moment lose, we cannot sleep, we cannot be lazy, we cannot forget to fight. The, the entrapments of the flesh. We are always watching, listening, always fighting this battlefield called life. And in heaven, the war has ceased. No more wrestling against sin. No more wrestling against the fleshly desires that remain. We need no armor in heaven. There is rest for your soul. Listen to the words of Revelation 14, 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. What a blessed place this will be. We've a foretaste of this rest in Christ but we are still plagued by the bombardments of sin all around us and from within us. But in heaven, we will have rest. If you are fighting, Christian, don't you know the fatigue? Now, if you're not fighting against your flesh, you know no such fatigue. You say, I really don't know what it means to be exhausted from fighting sin. I mean, really? I mean, is that for every Christian? If you're a believer and you're fighting the good fight, you know what it means to be utterly exhausted after hours, days, weeks, months of resisting and fighting, battling the unbelief of the evil one, the flaming darts that 
fly at you saying you can't trust his word. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you. Look at this. Look at that circumstance. You're constantly battling and you grow tired. You're exhausted. Crying out like the psalmist even, how long, O Lord, will this persist forever? In heaven, we will find rest from that battle. That is a glorious reality. And for the Christian who is battling, that ought to resonate in your soul. But while heaven is absolutely a place of rest, it is also a place of activity. It will not be a place of idleness. As one man said, we will not merely lounge within the pearly gates to gaze forever on the eternal beauty of our heavenly home. There is activity in heaven. We will fulfill the work to which we've been called, the work to love, the work to serve, the work to praise and worship God. It's not a place of sheer self-indulgence and self-gratification. We will work. There will be activity in heaven. Isaac Watts, in his hymn, Sweet is the, the Work, My God, My King, wrote this, And every power finds sweet employ in that eternal world of joy. And then what triumphs shall I raise to thy dear name through endless days? For in the realms of joy I'll see the fate, thy face in full felicity. There is no prospect of boredom in heaven. You know, I was reading Psalm 29 the other day. And you know what the psalmist tells us to do? He says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And as I read that and prayed, I thought, Lord, here I'm being told, give to God all of the glory due him. And I can't hardly comprehend, begin to comprehend the glory due this God. I can't even wrap my mind around the most basic elements of creation that are worshiping him in their being and just their existence how am i to ascribe to him to take the glory and say here god this is your this is all of the glory do you when i can't even comprehend it and he says ascribe to the lord it's work to praise god to worship him to serve him so much work in fact it will take an eternity to accomplish it an eternity to praise him. There will be no boredom, no, no boredom due to lack in heaven. We will be employed in the ceaseless worship and praise and adoration of God. Further, in the new heavens and the new earth, in the recreated or the redeemed world, we will have the work to do over this creation that Adam was given in its perfection. We'll have tasks to do. We'll have things, we'll, in our bodies, we will be working and serving. It's not a place where we just sit around like that man says, and lounge around and just look at the pearly gates. There is activity of service. Ruling as mankind was meant to before it was plunged into the corruption of sin. Heaven is a place of activity. Further, it is the fullness of joy. Listen to Psalm 16, 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The wicked of this age reason. All the things I love to do, the very things that I enjoy most, heaven's not going to have it. But for the believer who's tasted the presence of God, who's tasted of the true, live, experiential knowledge of the Lord, how much greater will it be in heaven? Think of it. Every single thought that you think in heaven can only bring pleasure. Every single action that you do, every single activity you participate in, only pleasure abounding, growing, multiplicating itself, increasing for eternity the fullness of joy. Why? Because we're fully in the presence of God, in whose presence is the fullness of joy, our pleasures forevermore. Listen again to Jonathan Edwards. The essence of heaven 
is the vision of God and the eternal increase of joy in him. The eternal increase. More and more and more joy and pleasure. Turn back to Second Peter chapter 1. We'll look finally that heaven is eternal. Second Peter 1.11 For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of the kingdoms of this world will come to an end. Rome had its ascendancy to power and it fell. The great Assyrians that were, they, the, the people trembled at the very mention of the name of the Assyrians. It is gone. America the Great, traveling down the same path of so many before it. But God has set on his holy hill of Zion a king. A king that even the gates of hell will not prevail against. His kingdom is eternal, imperishable, incorruptible. And brothers and sisters, it is this kingdom that you and I will enter that we might not perish with those other earthly kingdoms and kings, that we might live forever reigning with Christ. This is the eternal kingdom. It's the reason we fight. It's the reason we work. It's the reason we war against sin and add to our faith the virtues of the golden chain of Christian fruit. It's eternal. It is there. It is to be had. Those are glorious realities of heaven. But I want us to consider, just for the few final moments here, what Peter means when he says this will be richly provided for you. Look there in our text. For in this way, there will be richly provided. The New American Standard says abundantly supplied. What does this mean, richly provided, abundantly supplied? I want to share with you an illustration from John Brown about a vessel or a ship returning home after a long voyage and being received and welcomed by expectant friends. Listen to these words, this illustration of the ship returning home. She has been absent for years toiling and trafficking in every sea, touching at the ports and trading in the markets of many lands. Thus approaching at last her desired haven, the harbor from which she set out, whence loving thoughts went with her as she started on her perilous way, and where anxious hearts are now wishing and waiting for her return, she is descried in the distance. The news spread, all is excitements, multitudes assemble, Pier and quay, beach and bank are crowded with spectators as the little craft pushes on and every moment nears her destination. There she is, worn and weather-beaten. It is true, covered with the indications of sore travail and long service and with many signs of having encountered both battle and breeze, but all is safe. Her goodly freight is secure and uninjured. Her profits have been large. The merchandise she brings is both rare and rich. She is coming along a sunny sea, leaping and dancing as if she were alive. Her crew are on the deck, and with straining eyes and palpitating hearts are looking towards the shore. A soft wind swells the sails. The blue heavens are bending over the bark, as if smiling on her course, while the very waves seem to run before her, turning themselves about as if with conscious joy clapping their hands and murmuring a welcome. She bounds forward. She is over the bar. She is gliding now in smooth water, passing into port and preparing to moor and drop her anchor for the last time. While she does, there comes a shout from the assembled spectators, the crowds that witness and welcome her approach, loud as thunder, musical as the sea. Gladness and greeting are on every hand. Eloquent voices fill the air. The vessel has received an abundant entrance. Her crew have been met with sympathetic congratulations, are surrounded by eager and glad friends, hailed with enthusiasm, embraced with rapture, and accompanied to their homes with exaltation and song. A glorious picture of this ship returning home after months on the voyage. But then listen to the description of another ship. 
How different had she come in a wreck or struck on a rock? Lost her cargo and her crew saved only with difficulty and peril. And all of this the consequence of some grave neglect, ignorance or incapacity, carelessness or presumption, which attach on them the blame of the disaster. Even in this case, they would have reasons for gratitude, deep gratitude, that they were saved at all. Stripped as they were, their friends would welcome them with love and joy, but pity and sadness would mingle with that welcome. Congratulation would sound like rebuke or seem undeserved, and the poor mariners would require time to be reconciled to themselves. So, some such difference may exist in the circumstances and feelings of the saved. You have two pictures here. The one returning home, beaten by the waves, beaten by the long voyage, but the cargo is secure. They've been faithful to the end. They're expecting, and the people on the shore are eagerly awaiting them, anticipating their arrival. As the anchors go down, people shout with joy to receive them with hugs. And you think of the other ship. Because of some incapacity, because of carelessness of the crew members, their cargo's been lost. The ship barely makes it home. It's ready to sink. Praise God, they've made it. There's joy. But when they congratulate, it almost feels like a rebuke. We barely made it. Now take this into the Christian life. Here's the Christian running well, building faithfully, serving the Lord with all of their energy, their resources, working for the cause of the kingdom, the Christian who's made the qualities of verses 5 to 7 theirs, who's well acquainted with these virtues, who's eagerly building, zealously working. They're effective, they're fruitful, they're useful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the ship that's awaited for eagerly on the shore. The gates of heaven anxiously await. Here he comes. He's coming around the last bend. Get the trumpets ready. Let the sound resound. He's coming into the kingdom. He's going to be home with his Savior who he cherished so much. Have you ever met a believer that you're excited for them to meet Jesus? Because they so love him that you think, I can't wait for him to see his Lord, the Lord he so loves. Oh, that is this Christian, the Christian who builds, the Christian who's fruitful, who makes their calling and election sure, who runs, dances, leaps into heaven. This is the Christian that Peter is calling us to be. But then think of the converse. Think of the Christian who's barely hanging on. They're looking unto Jesus, but so many of the cares and distractions of this world have weighed them down. They build, but marginally so. They enter heaven, as Paul says to the Corinthians, but only as through fire. The picture, perhaps, as they enter heaven, the flames of hell nipping at their backside as they get pulled in. But hell's flames are right there. A drastically different picture of an entrance into heaven. And perhaps you say, oh, well, that's okay. They still inherit the eternal riches. They still get there. They still have eternal increase of joy and pleasure, right? I'll live that life. I'll have my distractions. I kind of like my distractions. I'll have my pleasures that this earth provides. And I'm still looking at Jesus, so I'll make it as through fire. That's fine. But Peter gives you no such reality, no such comfort here. Look at verse 10. What does he say at the end of verse 10? If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You, your case, may not be of one who enters as through fire. Your case may be one who never enters at all. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To have not built, to have not confirmed your calling and election, to have turned back to the pleasures and lusts of this world, to have the only thing awaiting you, the wrath of God. What a warning this is to fail, to, pro to fall, to prove yourself never being chosen, 
to prove yourself never being among the elect. And yet even now, for you listening to my words, these very words are an offer of mercy to you. Once you enter that life, it is fixed, it is determined. But even now, you are offered Christ, the glorious realities of heaven in their counter realities are equally terrifying. The eternal increase of joy will only be an e eternal increase of sorrow. The endless state of bliss will only be an endless state of horror. The cessation of all pain and agony will only be continuation of even greater ag agony. As magnificent as heaven will be, heaven will be, in its reverse, equally horrible. And there will be no grand entrance for you there. No shouts of acclamation, no bells ringing and trumpets resounding. To be cast into hell, you will drink the full measure of the cup of God's wrath poured full strength day after day, tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of Christ and his angels. He says the smoke of your torment will go up forever and ever, day after day, night after night, no rest. The call is to turn while there's still life in you. As you hear of these glorious realities of heaven, turn from your sin, to run to the Savior while there is still hope. But for the believer, this is it. Peter is saying, work, Christian. Work to know Jesus Christ. Work to grow in the true knowledge of who he is. And we ask how? And he says, by building. Building upon your faith with virtue. Virtue with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control, steadfastness with godliness, brotherly affection, and love. And so we say, why? So that you might make it to the end. So that there would be loud shouts of praise and acclamation, the trumpets of heaven blowing for you as you cross from this life into the next, a richly provided entrance into the blessed eternal kingdom of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let this hope spur us on to greater diligence to conform our lives to Christ. Well, amen. Father, thank you for these truths, these realities of heaven, too great for us to even grasp and understand. Lord, I pray that each of us here would know you through your Son and would spend eternity in an eternal increase of joy and bliss forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.